Okay. I'm going to go ahead and get started. Good evening and welcome to our webinar on the Preserving Black Churches Grant Program, a project of the African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund here at the National Trust for Historic Preservation. I'm Leslie Kanan, the Senior Manager for Preserving Black Churches. I'm joined here today by Alaska McKinnis, the Director of the National Grants Program for the Action Fund, and Tiffany Tolbert, the Senior Director of Preservation for the Action Fund. Tonight, we will do an overview of the grant program, including eligibility and changes to this grant round. We'll also talk generally about the schedule for this grant round and tips for the letter of intent. Then we will open it up for questions. Again, please use the question button at the bottom of the screen for questions at any time during the presentation. One thing I wanna mention generally is that the letter of intent is the first phase of this application round. And then after that, it'll be followed by the full application submittal. This is an extremely competitive grant. And what we want you to focus on at this point is the submittal of the letter of intent. The letter of intent is something that we use to help figure out if you're eligible for the grant and if you have, if you, and if you're actually ready um, for the grant, meaning if you're actually ready to start your project. And so it's really important, and we're gonna go over this during the presentation, um, for you to really look um, at the questions and really think about the project that you wanna submit to make sure that you're both eligible. So that means really looking at the guidelines and we'll go over some of those um, and really think about the project that you want to submit and thinking about if you're really ready to start it, if you are actually able to get the grant. And so the letter of intent really helps us look at that. Um, and so again, this is an extremely competitive grant. We really want you to focus at this point on the, on the letter of intent. The overall purpose of grants from preserving black churches is to preserve historic black houses of worship, either with active or non-active congregations. The grants are intended to advance ongoing preservation activities while strengthening the capacity for historic congregations and preservation and community organizations to steward, manage, and better utilize their historic structures. The grants are available to entities representing historic black churches that include either the historic black church itself. I would note churches do not have to be a 501c, 501c3 entity, but they will need to provide a federal tax ID number to apply. You can also be a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and that includes organizations directly connected to a historic black church, such as a preservation foundation, a friends group and society, as well as community organizations. You can also be a public agency. This includes municipalities and public colleges or universities and state governments. The grant range will range from $50,000 to $500,000. Eligible projects must fall under one of the five funding categories, which includes capital projects, endowments and financial sustainability, organizational capacity and operations, programming and interpretation, and project planning. The maximum grant award will depend on the funding category applied, which eligible applicants is applying for funding and the current use of the historic black church building by an active or non-active congregation. For eligible applicants, also note, if you have received previous national trust grants, you are eligible to apply for preserving black churches provided all grant requirements are current. This also includes previous African American, African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund National Grant grantees, Conserving Black Modernism grantees, and HBCU Initiative grantees. However, these grantees can only apply under a different funding category than previously awarded. For example, a National Grant Program grant recipient of capital projects funding is not eligible to apply to Preserving Black Churches for a capital grant but could apply under a new funding category, such as project planning. The other thing I would note is that for all of our grants, all, none of them require a match with the exception of 
are endowment and financial sustainability. So for all of our grants, there's no match required except for endowment and financial sustainability in which you would have to raise a match. As mentioned previously, the purpose of the grants from preserving black churches is to preserve historic black houses of worship. So the first consideration to determine eligibility is whether the proposed project involves a historic black church. The purpose of this program, a historic black church is as what is on the, currently on the screen, which is religious historic buildings built and erected by black congregations and continuously occupied by active black congregations. And the building must be no less than 50 years old. Or religious historic buildings designed and or constructed by black architects or builders currently occupied by active black congregations or repurposed for arts, culture, community, and social justice programs. These buildings must also be no less than 50 years old. Lastly, your building could be a religious historic building not originally built for black congregations, but they are continuously occupied by an active black congregation for at least 50 years old. This criteria is inclusive of active and non-active congregations, as well as vacant religious buildings previously associ associated with a historic black congregation. You must meet this requirement when applying for all categories with the exception of programming and interpretation. A proposed project and subject property should meet at one of these criteria. The second consideration to determining eligibility is the congregation. All applicants must meet the requirements for congregations listed on, on the screen. For instance, active historic congregations that are part of historic black religious denominations, including, but not limited to, African Methodist Episcopal churches, African Methodist Episcopal Zion churches, the Baptist church, Christian Methodist Episcopal churches, and Church of God in Christ or non-denominational churches. The other ones are active historic black congregations that are part of a traditional religious denominations, including, but not limited to, the Episcopal Church, the Lutheran Church, United Methodist Church, the Presbyterian Church, or the Catholic Church. Remember, if I did not call out your denomination, it does not mean that you're eligible. Remember, this is just a sample list. I would also note that non-Christian Black congregations and churches, this means non-Christian churches can be funded on a case-by-case -case basis in consultation with Lilly Endowment Incorporated, which is our funder. Now we will talk about some changes that are different from previous rounds. For applicants applying for capital projects with active congregations, you can submit projects for up to $500,000. Applicants potentially have three years to complete the project depending on the scope of work and the award. For applicants applying for capital projects that are for not-for-profits not and public agencies with non-active congregations, you can submit projects for up to $250,000. We will also now accept letters of intents with scopes of work that include restoration, rehabilitation, and preservation of interior sanctuary features, such as historic church pews, pulpits, altars, baptismal fonts, and baptismal pools. For those committing for organizational capacity, you can now apply for up to $300,000 for three years, as opposed to previously for two years. For those applying for endowment and financial sustainability, you can submit for a match up to $500,000. You might also have up to three years to raise your match depending on how much you are trying to raise. And now, I will have, I will introduce Alaska McGinnis, who will talk about our applicant roadmap. Hello everyone. Thank you again for joining us this evening. It's a pleasure to be here with you and to discuss a little bit more about what the applicant experience will be and some important dates and tips that you will need to make, uh, make note of. So um, first, 
is the important date of April, uh, August 19th that's coming up on Monday. The letter of intent is due. Some of you may note um, on the websites, there are two separate due dates. The first one in our process is August 19th. That is when this initial application, which we're referring to as the letter of intent or the LOI is due. This is the first application that you will encounter with this process. It is very succinct and specific in our efforts to really understand what the project is and to determine eligibility and readiness. The next important date that you'll need to make note of is September 6th. So this is the date in which you will be notified of the status of your application and those who have been chosen to submit a full application will be notified and will then be able to start submitting a full application online via the same um, online portal, which is found in. During this time, um, applicants are strongly encouraged to make appointments with our staff um, if they have questions or need some assistance. Um, it is during this process when, when those who have been selected have moved forward to submit a full application, their next due date is October 4th. This is when the full application is due. Mid-November, all applicants will be notified of their status. Those applications that are chosen, again, to move forward in the next round to be considered will be required to meet with National Trust staff over the next month to work on strengthening and revising their application before final scoring. So this is uh, one of those processes where we have several like points through the process in which we are kind of vetting and narrowing that pool down to the final list of grantees that will be selected for support. Um, this final review period will begin in January. After that, all applicants will be notified of their status by announcement day, which will be on February 24th, 2025. Um, and now I'll share with you some LOI form tips. Um, please note when we're asking the question about the church building date, we're asking specifically about the structure that is at the core of the application. We're not asking about the date in which the congregation was established. Um, we understand that those are two separate dates for a lot of institutions. So we are specifically asking about the church that is at the source of the application. Um, what is that church building date? Um, also, we're asking specifically um, questions about the church history and significance. Please note that in this question, we're asking to understand the church history, not necessarily um, a listing of different uh, individuals that help support the, uh, the church in terms of personnel and or pastors. We're looking to understand the church history in terms of its impact on the community that's surrounding and the significance that it's had in your relative areas. Um, for capital projects, please note that for this category, it's very important that the project scope and planning work be clearly um, described. Um, we want to ensure that the scope of work is very clearly kind of articulated in this letter of intent so that we understand that this project would be ready to go and start as soon as you were theoretically funded in the end. And that starts with a very solid scope of work that is that can be detailed in your application. So please take the time to really articulate what planning has taken place to date. Um, moving on to the endowment category. For this one, please note, as per the um, criteria for this particular program, for this particular category, we are looking to understand the financial planning that's happened to date. We're looking to understand what kind of um, rehabilitation work or restoration work that's taken place at your, your respective church or institution. Um, please make sure that that information is clearly articulated on your application. And again, it's critical that everyone really pay close attention to the criteria that's listed on our website and also take the time to review um, our frequently asked questions that is available on our website as well. And I'm sure Priya will probably drop those two links in the chat for your review. So please make sure, I can't stress that enough. The best applications are always the ones that have made it clear that they have really thoroughly read those uh, criteria and eligibility. Um, moving on to organizational capacity, 
Um, please, this is a specific category that is looking to support hiring personnel, but again, that is preservation focused. So please note that that is a very specific criteria that is unique to preserving black churches. Unlike the national grant program, this is uniquely centered on preservation work for this organization, organizational capacity category. Please make sure that you are really clearly, again, demonstrating the needs assessment that's taking place for this, for this particular role, the planning that's taking place to ensure that this person would be supported via a strategic plan, um, anything that's happened to ensure that this role is well thought out and you're prepared to start with the hiring process in terms of a job description, et cetera, on day one. Um, for programming and interpretation, again, this is one that has uh, the project scope and planning work. We're looking to understand the detail and what this programming and interpretation effort would be, um, what conversations have taken place with any, say, historic preservationist and or artist to help kind of clearly tell the story of what this program would be or this interpretation effort. Please, again, make time to really tell, help us with the narrative in that space that's available on the LOI. Note that there are places for you to check off boxes to indicate, yes, we've done this, yes, we've done that, but the narrative will help us really firm up the context for your selecting of your selection of those yeses um, on the application. Again, project planning, the scope of work would be very important for this category as well, along with capital projects. Please make sure that you are really clear on what that, what that is and what should be included there and include any planning that is taking place, um, detail on that planning that's taking place to date. And now tips to remember. So again, as I noted, it's critical that everyone really take a deep dive into the guidelines and eligibility. The link is listed here for your review and also likely in the chat. Um, as you are going through the LOI, you'll note that the spaces actually count in the character limit. So each question in the narrative has a limit of say 1000 and in that is included the spaces. So please try to be succinct in your responses um, as if you go over the character limit, the form will not allow you to submit. So please pay attention to that as you're working through this. Next, in terms of the application's primary contact or main point of contact, make sure that that is the person who we will need to engage with as we move this project forward. Sometimes folks indicate like senior leadership at the church um, for the main point of contact and not necessarily the people that will be like on the ground and supporting the steps that move through this process. So please be mindful that the person who will be the main point of contact for this grant will get all the notifications, all of the emails, all of the questions that we may have about the status of a project. This is where we will reach out. So please make note of that and ensure that you've selected the proper individual to be that main point of contact. You can have multiple contacts on an application, but the main point of contact, there is a singular primary contact that we will engage with. So that's important to know. Um, if As you're going through the process, if you get a warning as you're registering your organization, that means that there is a profile for your organization in the system already. That's not an issue. Just reach out to us at actionfundgrants at savingplaces.org. And we can work with you to make sure that you are added to the existing profile for your organization. Um, that happens often. Um, it's one system and we all use it across the National Trust. So say you've applied for support through a different program, um, that profile will still exist. So if you're having trouble logging in, please reach out to us and we will support you. Um, another note for the LOI is that all questions with an asterisk are required. So if you are going through the application and you see an, a question that has an asterisk that you're not ready to not ready or prepared to answer, please save your application and return to it. You will not be able to submit until that question is answered. And lastly, I have these uh, email addresses that you would need to try and save um, 
in your respective inboxes. Please make sure that you have action fund grants at savingplaces.org. Um, this is the, the main point of contact that you'll want to utilize in your efforts to kind of get any clarity that you need um, about the application process or any struggles that you're having with logging in, et cetera. We also have black churches at savingplaces.org. And lastly, you have administrator at grantinterface.com. Please make note that administrator at grantinterface.com is a automated email that's coming from our grant management system. So we do not monitor that inbox. So you would not want to email that particular email address. We just want you to make sure that that email is not sending, is not going straight to junk mail because this is where you will get reminders about um, a overdue or coming up due follow-up request or any kind of notifications about an interim report, those system emails will be coming from that particular email address. So please make note of that. All right, and we have now reached the Q&A portion of our uh, webinar. And we will start with these questions now. Please make sure that you are utilizing this Q&A link at the bottom of the page. We It's so much easier and we're trying to make sure we're organizing these questions. Don't put them in the chat. It's a lot of greetings, a lot of conversations happening there, which we welcome. But your questions that you have about this particular program, please make sure that you're adding those to the Q&A so that we can answer them for you. Okay, the so first question we have, our church is a nonprofit. How are we don't have a 501c3, but we have an EIN number. How do we go about answering the tax status portion of the LOI? Um, so if you have an EIN number, that's all you need. And so is there a certain way Alaska they should put on their tax status? Because I know they just need the number, but is there a certain way they should um, answer that tax status number? No, they just, you would want to enter that, indicate that on the form and you, you'll be fine. That's that's all that we need in, in terms of determining how we would be able to essentially work with you when if, if you were selected for a grant, we'd need that information in order to pay out. Second question, does the church applying have to be a historic landmark church in their city or can they just be an old historic church? Um, none of the churches have to be locally designated or nationally designated. Um, as we indicated um, sort of during the presentation um, that the building itself, if it's if it's anything but programming and interpretation, um, we are looking for buildings that are about 50 years or older. Um, so that's what we're looking for, but they do not need to be locally designated. The third question is, um, what is the definition of historic? Um, and what we're talking about in terms of when we're talking about the actual building, again, we are looking um, at buildings that are about 50 years or older. Um, and when you're talking about your narrative, when we're asking you to de describe the history of your church, um, we're really looking for you to connect um, your church and its impact um, on the community and its impact on any of the events, um, either locally, um, whether that's your city, your your county, your state, or nationally. The next question is: Please define um, program interpretation. Um, I'm I'm assuming that what you're asking is um, that particular category, like what you can do, what you're asking under that particular um, category, um, and essentially what we're what that category is about is how your church wants to tell its story and all the different ways that you can do that. Um, and so in the past, different churches have done that all sorts of ways, um, whether that's an exhibit, whether that's a program, whether that's engaging um, an artist in doing some sort of display, um, there's all sorts of really creative ways um, to do that. Um, so that's what we mean by programming and interpretation. Um, and one of the things that I would encourage you to do um, is look at some of the, look at the definition in our guidelines um, and look at some of the different things that you can do there. Um, what qualifies as a church, um, qualifies as a, his, a church historic um, 
I, I hopefully I answered that um, during the presentation in terms of those two different definitions in terms of the building and the congregation. If awarded, is there a scenario where I request a specific amount that the amount rewarded would be lessened? Yes, that does happen often where you might um, request a certain amount um, and we might give you a different amount. So that does happen um, quite often. Please to turn, uh, find the term non-active congregation. Um, so this happens quite often. Um, there are situations where you have a where you have a church in which the the congregation is is actually not active. Like they're they're not there's not actually a congregation that actually worships at that church. It could be that they they own the building and they worship at a different church, but they still own the building. Um, so that's what we mean by um, a non active congregation. The next question is, we are listed as a historical black church. However, we did we did renovation on the existing building. Are we still considered historic, a historical black church building? Um, yes, you're you're allowed to do um, you know, changes on on your building. We again are gonna go back to those definitions um that we went over um during the presentation, and they're also available um on our website in terms of how we defined um historic black churches. The question is, do both the building and congregation requirements um, need to be met? Um, in the case, in, with the exception of programming and interpretation, that answer is yes. Would stained glass windows be included in capital projects? Yes, we get those requests all the time. So yes, definitely um, stained glass windows would be included. Would an HVAC system be considered in capital projects? Um, yes. Um, and um, just to, and, and this is a good place. Some of these questions are actually included in some, in our FAQs. Um, so I'd encourage um, many of you to look at our FAQ system, uh, at our FAQ, but um, yes, definitely HVAC, HVAC system is one of those things that can be um, covered in capital projects. Um, does capital projects include window replacement? Also, will this presentation be made available for review after the Zoom session? Um, so window replacements, um, one of the things that we, we look at is um, in historic preservation um, projects, we are really looking for uh, window repair and window rehabilitation as opposed to um, strictly window replacements. So we would really need to look um, case by case in terms of that, that project. Um, so we need to know more about that project. Um, and yes, um, there will this this presentation um, will be emailed um, to those who registered. Um, can you explain the difference between um, capital projects and, and pro um, project planning? Um, one of the things that I would and um, encourage everybody to do um, is go to our website and um, look look at the requirements. Um, for capital projects and, and project planning. Um, but one of the main differences is, is capital projects allow you to do um, physical work on your building, um, such as you know looking at rehabilitation on those stained glass windows or looking at um, doing something about your foundation or looking at doing work to your um, baptismal pool. Project planning is sort of what you do before you get there. Um, it would allow you to do a historic assessment of your building so you could figure out actually what you need to do before you get to a capital project. Um, so the, the project planning happens before um, the capital project is the best way to describe that. Um, but I'd really encourage you to go to our website and really look at all of the things that um, are available um, under project planning and under capital projects. And that'll really be able to um, let you know, because so, there's some really amazing um, planning projects um, that you can do that can make you ready um, for a capital project. The one thing I would say, I would stop here and say that everybody wants to submit a capital project. 
because everybody has something that's physically, usually everybody has something that's um, physically wrong um, or that could be improved about their church. And that is the most competitive um, grant that we have. But one of the first things that we're gonna look at is a sense of readiness. Do you actually know, have you done the planning? Have you done the work before to be ready for a capital project? And so often sometimes you might wanna start with planning because if you don't have the right amount of planning to be ready for a capital project, it's not gonna make you very competitive for our capital project. So really think about how much planning you really have done and think about whether maybe it's the right time for a planning project instead of a capital project. So I'd really think about that as you're looking at the scopes that you're preparing to submit and think about how much planning you've done and think about maybe is it re are you is it time for planning or is it time for capital? Pertaining to a cemetery, does the cemetery have to be located next to the church? Um, the cemetery has to be owned by the church and the cemetery has to be, I'm trying to remember, Tiffany, do you know this off the top of your head? It has to be contiguous to the church, I believe. Yeah, so cemeteries are eligible, but they are eligible in the planning category and they do have to be um, contiguously connected to the church site. So they have to be adjacent to the church building. So under preserving black churches, we will fund cemeteries when they meet that criteria. If they are across town or down the street, um, they would not be eligible for planning. They're also not eligible for um, capital. So any cemetery restoration or uh, marker restoration or things of that nature. So it needs to be focused on the planning category, which could include survey. It could um, include archeology span or ground penetrating radar. Um, it also could be planning for interpretation of the cemetery grounds, but in order for it to be eligible, it does need to be located next to and adjacent to the church building. The next question is, can we apply for both endowment and capital? So you can apply for both, but in the end, we will only, if we were to choose you to move on to the next phase, we would only choose one project. Um, and so you can, again, you can apply for, you know, how many categories you want to, but in the end, if we chose you to move forward to a full application, we would only choose one. Um, so, so yes, um, you can apply for more than one category. Um, it says the LOI tips, all of these are required. Not clear on this question. Um, the, the, in the tips, we are, you know, just sort of trying to, to help a bit. Um, it's up to you whether you take, you know, take what we say and, um, and do those, but, you know, we're sort of trying to give you our expertise based on, uh, you know, the fact that, you know, we created the applications, um, but um, some of the tips are like, you know, the asterisk tips and the, and the spaces, like those, those are things that um, you have to do, but I would, I would definitely suggest that you take our advice, but you're not required to. Um, is there a LOI form that I will receive? Um, so when you log into the site, um, found in site, um, the, LO, the, the LOI form will be there. So it's not something that you have to um, create. Um, if the church wants to have a roof redone and a room and the fellowship hall redone, what project would that fall under? Um, that would definitely be a capital project. How many grants do you fund um, per cycle? Um, so we don't have, it says for the capital projects. So we don't have like specific per category. I can tell you that the last two rounds, we um, I think funded um, 35 um, each round, but we don't, we don't break it out by, like we don't say, oh, we're gonna fund this many capital projects. We don't do it that way. 
but I can tell you that we funded 35 um, last round, and I think about 34 or 35 the first round, if I remember correctly. Um, I answered this question already about capital projects and project planning. Um, is a church building where construction was started more than 50 years ago um, eligible? Um, it can be um, as long as it, it meets um, all the all the other criteria listed. We are a historic congregation. Our church is historic. We worshiped there before we bought it. Therefore, we have not worshiped there for 50 years. Let me read this again. We are a historic congregation. Our church is historic. We worshiped there before we bought it. Therefore, we have not worshiped there for 50 years. So it sounds like this might be a non-active congregation situation. So you have the building, which is historic, but you maybe haven't worshiped there in a long time. So it sounds like if I'm understanding this, that it's a non-active congregation situation, you'd be eligible for less money. Um, if I'm understanding that correctly is what it sounds like to me. Um, it says under which category would church replacement of air conditioning and replacement of roof be? Um, that's a capital project. Um, we will be submitting for restoration of pews in the church as well as the parsonage, which has been redesignated as an education building as well as community food distribution. The parsonage is adjacent to the church. It was built shortly after um, church in the 1900. I guess, are you asking if this is a capital project? It's a capital project. Um, we are a new um, congregation that recently moved into a historically black church landmark, which was previously abandoned for about two years. We are currently renting this space. Um, the one thing I would say is um, some of these are very specific um, questions that are specific to your situation. Um, and because there are so many questions um, and we wanna try to get to as many as possible, I would suggest that if you have a really specific question, um, you email us so that we can get to some of the more general questions that apply to more people. Um, we'll try to swing back to them if we can, but I'm gonna try to um, get to some of, more, some of the more general questions. For the scope of work description, is that the same as the project description? If not for capital projects, please confirm where the scope is found. Um, the scope is something that you create. So the scope of work is where you're gonna describe what your project is. And that's not just for capital projects, but for all projects. Um, you're gonna be describing for us what your project is. Leslie, can I add something? Yes, please do. Yeah, so your scope of work when we use that term is specifically the project that you are requesting funding for. We do understand your projects might be larger, they might have multiple phases, but what we want to understand is exactly how the funding you're requesting of preserving black churches will be applied to that project. So your scope of work is the specific deliverables or results of the project. So if you have a capital project and you are saying, we want to restore our stained glass windows, we want to understand what that process for restoring stained glass windows will be. What are their condition? What are your consultants or your contractor saying how they will repair it and how much that will cost and how much and how our funding would go toward that. So that is the scope of work. So when we use that term, that's what we want to know. We want to know what is the work that's going to be completed under the project you're applying for and how our funding will assist with that. Thanks, Tiffany. Um, you do have to own the church to be able to apply. Um, and again, I would, 
I would, um, for people who are asking what's covered in capital projects, I would encourage you to go to our website and look at the different things that are, are eligible. If you have questions, um, please follow up with an, with an email to us with what your scope is if you have questions. Um, there's a question about um, past applications. Um, we did go through a process where we did give um, feedback. Um, so we actually have already um, done that where we gave feedback to people who requested that. Um, um, again, all the sort of limits in terms of the LOI will be contained in the LOI in terms of character limits and all that sort of stuff will be, so you'll only be able to um, type what's within the LOI. Um, again, we will be sharing um, the webinar to all those who um, have registered. Um, so there's a question about um, budget. Um, there is a place, um, the budget, the LOI is not required, um, but if you do have a budget, you can go ahead and attach it. Um, at this point, there's a question about whether um, churches can apply together. Um, and at this point, um, we don't um, have the ability, churches have to apply individually at this time. Um, Mr. Bivens, if you could, um, Darwin Bivens, if you could email me, because I'm not clear on what FMBC is. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that's your church. Um, so email me so I can understand more about that situation. Um, the reason why the grant is highly competitive um, is because there's a lot of need and only so much funding and a lot of amazing projects. Um, yes, for capital projects, um, three quotes are required from different contractors. Um, Alaska, can you um, handle this one? How do you obtain or check to see if your church has an EIN number? Sure, I will share a, um, a link in the chat. This is a IRS uh link that you would need to look at to confirm whether or not your organization already has um, this standing or this uh, distinction. I will share it with you in a moment. There is a question about um, whether the church or the foundation applies. This actually comes up a lot. And I would say it's whoever has the actual um, status, but this is, you know, this is sort of a, a decision that the church needs to make. Um, the, you know, the foundation and the church sort of need to, to, to decide um, who, who should apply. Because in many cases, either can, can, can apply, actually. Um, it depends on the status of each. Um, so there's a question about the congregation being older than the church that, that, that's very typical. Again, as long as the church is at least 50 years old, 
um, and you're fine. Again, this applies to all categories except for programming and interpretation. Um, so if you're going um, after something other than programming and interpretation, we're just looking for that um, building to be around 50 years old. No, I'm sorry, I should say the question I'm, I'm, I'm responding to. At the LOI stage, you are you don't need to be worried um, about submitting three bids at this point. So the bid question comes much later. You don't need to be worried about that um, at this stage. Um, I'll ask it. There's a question um, about DUNS. Is, is is a DUNS number needed for a payout and processing or no? Because the founder is private. I'm sorry. Say that one more time. It says is a DUNS DUNS number needed for payout and processing. Yes, I mean we would we would need to have a um a EIN number in order to process the payment out um, for either the organization or their fiscal agent. So if there isn't an active um, EIN number associated with the organization that you represent in terms of your church, um, we would need to work with a fiscal agent, um, someone who would essentially be responsible for the payout of the funds in lieu of yourselves, who would we would send the funding to directly and they would then um, share the funding with you directly. Says, will this grant cover any repairs needed or specific types of repairs? Um, so um, we are specifically looking um, for the types of repairs that are related um, to preserving the church. Um, and again, for, for more specific information, um, I would suggest that you email us. Um, let's see. Um, if you want um, you want help with um, those who want help with the letter of intent um, should email us directly. Um, there's a question about um, what defines a black church and um, we went over that in the presentation. So hopefully um, that was answered. Oh, there's, oh, there's an addition and thing. So in terms of um, diverse congregations, um, we don't, we're not going to sort of um, ask you to tell us, well, you know, how many Black members and, and, and how many non-Black members you have. At the end of the day, we're going to look at, we want you to look at the basic definition of what a Black church is. You know, was this church, you know, built for and by Black people? you know, was, is this church, you know, to the Black church? It doesn't matter if it has non-Black people in it. That's fine. It can be a diverse church, but what, what is the purpose of the church? That is what we're looking for. Um, can a nonprofit apply on, on behalf of a Black church? Absolutely. Um, for the match issue, again, the only um, grant that requires a match um, is for um, endowment and financial su um, sustainability. And Leslie, we've had a couple of questions about um, mortgage and debt repayment. And I think we just need to state that that is not an eligible expense of this grant. So um, I've been answering those questions in the Q&A, but just to be clear, um, debt repayment um, loans, mortgages is not eligible, an eligible project for funding. Um, neither is new construction um, of a church building or additions. Um, so wanted to make those clear in terms of ineligible expenses. Um, we um, There's a question about when the next date for the next round of applications. Um, we do not know that date um, yet. That will be sometime next year, probably around the same time, but we, we don't know that yet. There's a question about um, whether funds are awarded directly to individual churches or to an archdiocese, and we give them to the church. Um, it they, says our church. Or they could go to the diocese if they're the applicant. The funds are awarded to the applicant. So 
pay attention to eligible categories of applicant. That is who would receive the funds. So it's important to decide who is putting in the application because that EIN number is who would be receiving the grant funds and be responsible for administering and managing the grant. That is correct. Um, there's a question about um, church murals. Yes, we have church murals are um, um, included. Um, there's a question about um, eligible uses for capital projects. Um, I would just encourage you to go to our website um, and, and look um, at the eligible uses on our site. Um, see um do you have examples of good lois um we we don't i mean in terms of we don't um generally um share those especially because our loi form is different than the loi form that we've used um in the past um so all we can do is just um you know encourage you to um you know, sort of focus, you know, on the questions and um, focus on the tips um, that we've given during the during the presentation and reach out to us um, with questions if you have them. Um, there's some questions about if there's damage to churches or if there's like there's a question about like a tornado or different things like that. Um, I would just encourage you to reach out with those sort of specific questions because if there's damages to church, they, they could still qualify um, if the church is still around. Um, we, as Tiffany mentioned, we won't replace a church that's no longer there. Um, it says, what is the importance of meeting with historic preservationists and how um, to, um, to find a professional historic preservationist? Um, it would be a really good idea, um, depending on your project, to meet with a um, professional person. Um, and there, and so for those looking for those types of resources, you can reach out to us through email. Um, you might want to start with your local um, state historic preservation office. It's the first place I would start. And depending where you are, there might be other even closer local resources to help you um, find um uh, a local preservationist but that's probably the very first place i would start um is with your local um state office for historic preservation um there's one question about applying under a single application like two categories under a single application you can't do that um you have to apply um through different applications There's a question about whether a church has to be currently occupied to be eligible. It does not. Parking lots are not eligible. Graveyards are not eligible under capital grants. You will uh, eventually, um, you do need to have an idea. You might at this point, not have to have the exact cost at the LOI stage, but you do need to have some idea of what your project costs since you'll be asking us for a specific amount. Um, we're looking, there's a question about whether you can um, apply for like a church property as opposed to a ch an actual church it looks like and it really needs to be a, a property I mean a, a church building it's a question about whether the church if if, if the if a cemetery can be included with the church if it's a planning project yes. And there's a question about when will the funds be dispersed? That's funds wouldn't be dispersed until next year if you were awarded. 
this is actually a really good question about in terms of um, our funds, um, do we award things um, outside of the US? Um, and so in the, in outside of the continental US, but not places like South Africa, no, but places like the US Virgin Islands, yes. So US territories are absolutely eligible. There's not a limit um, on the number of times a church can apply. Um, let's see. Sorry, the, I lost my place here. I'll also add, we've had a number of questions about acquisition of property. That is also an ineligible expense. So um, any purchasing of property, whether it's a building or land, is not eligible. It says, um, please clarify organization and operations category and does updates and repairs needed to the congregation qualify in this category? So I think, so these are two actually, I think you can't moving here. These are actually two different things here. So if you need updates and repairs, um, that would fall under um, capital, but organizational, organization and operations is an actual position. So you're you're asking for money to to hire someone. Um, and this would be a person who's really looking to um, oversee your preservation program or oversee a preservation project or look at, you know, the preservation that needs to happen at your church. Not clergy, not a maintenance person, but someone who's really focused on, you know, preservation at your church. So that's a position, and that's different than a capital than a capital project, which would be focused on getting money to do the repairs um, needed um, at your church. Um, so there's a question about um, how churches are selected. Are, are smaller churches looked at differently? Um, and really when we're looking at selection, we really are looking at, especially at, at this point right now with, with LOIs, we really are looking at scopes of work. We're looking at readiness. Um, we're looking at, are you ready? Um, to, are your scopes of work clear? Um, do your projects make sense? Um, are you know that's what we're looking at. And so whether we've we have um, done grants, and it's a good idea perhaps if some of you um, go to our website and look at previous projects, you'll see that we've made awards to small churches, that we've made awards to large churches, um, that some that have small congregations, some that have big congregations. And so it really is about, um, you know, your, your project, um, your readiness, your, you know, your story, um, your ability to, you know, really be able to help shepherd this project. Um, that's, that's what we're looking at. Um, it says if the church has started some repairs and the money that is needed we do not have to complete a lot of projects. Are we still able to receive the grant? Um, one thing I want to make clear, because I saw this somewhere else, is we do not reimburse for work that has already been done. So if you've started work on a project um, and are looking for money to reimburse that project, um, we won't pay for, for work that has already been done. But if you want to start a new phase, for work that has that has not yet been started, um, that is something that you could apply for.
So this says, is providing quotes for a building repair that the church cannot afford something we can add to the application? Yes, absolutely. And yes, this is another question about, you know, the church is a black church that is now mixed. Absolutely, you can apply. Um, don't worry about your three estimates for the LOI. That comes later. I've had a few questions that I've answered about um, payments. So just to confirm, in terms of the, the payment process, um, we, at the end of the, the review period, once at the grantees are notified, we will send out some documentation that needs to be completed and uploaded into Foundant. So that would be the grant agreement, the W-9, and the electronic fund transfer form. Once those, in, those documents have been received and reviewed and are complete, we will initiate the first payment. Um, but the funds altogether are split out into two to three payments um, over the life cycle of the grant. So the, there won't be one singular payment in which all of the funds will ma be made available. We do have points in the process in which our grantees will be required to check in with us and submit, say, for example, the initial interim report. This is a report that is required at the midpoint of the project. So where, whenever a grantee gets to that halfway mark, we do ask them to submit an interim report to let us know what's happening. And once that report is approved, we move forward to the next phase. Um, it's important to note though, in terms of the, um, the payment structure, this depends on the category. So different categories have different payout instructions. So for endowment, it'll be a very different situation compared to capital. So it all just really depends, but all of this information will be shared with those grantees once, it's, it, once that time comes um, so that everyone is very clearly informed and knows what they're looking into in terms of planning for their project. Been answering um, a lot of questions regarding again the scope and capital and planning and so someone asked about would it be advisable to apply for both planning and capital and as leslie stated you can apply and submit a loi application in multiple categories though we do advise particularly with the planning and capital category is to pay attention and make sure those requests don't contradict each other so if you apply for planning um to find out what your capital scope is and the cost, we would um, look very closely at those applications and we would have questions. And so they might cancel each other's out during the review. But if you did submit both, I would say, make sure you explain in the capital how planning would be completed if you were awarded funds. So just it's important to pay attention if you are submitting multiple applications under multiple categories that it doesn't appear that you need to complete one of one project before you're able to do the other. Um, so again, the competitiveness of the program is very important um, to consider when you're deciding to submit applications and thinking about the sequencing of your project. There, I'm noticing there's a couple of questions about um, other buildings that, and it, and it depends. So there's, I've seen a couple of questions about things like um, parsonages. And as long as they are on the same land as the, on the same lot as the church and also meet the same requirements as the historic um, church, they also um, are eligible for the grant as well. Um, there's a there's a question about accessibility upgrades, and one of the things I would say about accessibility upgrades is often um, we like to see those as a planning grant, 
um, because we like for people to really look at um, accessibility holistically because often people like to have a specific solution but they haven't really looked at their whole building. Now, if you've already done planning for accessibility, then absolutely you can do those as a capital project. Um, but um, again, it depends on how much planning um, that you've done around accessibility, but it's really a case by case basis. So that might be something that you might wanna um, reach out to us by email, but um, depending on how much planning has been done, we either do, do those as a planning grant or as a capital grant. Just going through the questions. Um, a church on the National Register is absolutely, absolutely eligible, but just to remember your church is not required to be on a National Register. The, your project can absolutely include both interior and, and, and exterior aspects. If you don't get selected this year, you absolutely can apply next year. Um, so again, raising money for a match only applies for endowment and um, sustainability, the endowment and sustainability category. It doesn't apply to any of the other categories. And that's one thing I, I would really encourage everybody to go to our website and really thoroughly read each category um, and, and what you can do with each category um, to see what is the best fit for you in terms of um, what you would like to do. This is, is a nonprofit organization formed to preserve a historic black church that is no longer used by its former congregation and eligible applicant. Uh, that's, that, <laughs> that really sounds like something that y'all need to figure out um, in terms of who, who you want to apply on your behalf. Um, grant funding cannot, so we can't, so there's there's a question about can grant funds be used for consultations? And so again, we can't reimburse you. So if you hired somebody to help you with the grant, we cannot reimburse that because that's something that happened before the grant was actually awarded. There's a question about if an assessment for repair was done in 2019, is this an acceptable form of project planning? Um, yes. Um, and again, it depends on, you know, what that was. But yes, previous previous planning um, is, is acceptable depending on what type of planning that was. Again, I want to reiterate, parking lots are not are not um, eligible. Um, so um, I would encourage people to, to go to um, our website, but I do want to just briefly describe um, endowment and financial sustainability. Um, so essentially um, what you are doing um, is you, one of the things that we find is that um, churches will um, have, will do like a major renovation 
and then not really have the money over years to really sustain the amazing work that they've done. And so we've created this category in which you will raise a certain amount of money and then we will match. So let's say you raise $50,000 and then you have to, you know, potentially two years to raise that $50,000. We will then match that $50,000. And then you will invest all of that money into an endowment account. And then over time, you will be able to draw a percentage of that money down to be able to deal, well, to be able to pay for um, the different preservation things um, that come up at your church, the different um, preservation maintenance or preservation things that you need to pay for um, at your church. So the things that, to upkeep the preservation work at your church and the endowment can only be used um, for preservation work. Um, some churches already have a preservation endowment or already have an existing endowment, some churches would be creating a new endowment. But that's essentially um, what that category is for. And you can create an endowment for as little as $50,000 um, up to um, $500,000, which we would match. Um, so that's essentially um, what that category is for. But remember, it's an investment. It's not money that you get to use right away. You would be investing it and then pulling down a percentage of it um, over time um, to be able to help you um, take care of your building over time. I've had a few questions of answered specific to um, multiple applications. I think we may have mentioned this before, but just to add, um, yes, your organization can apply during this round for multiple categories. However, if you are selected to move forward, you will only be awarded for one of those categories. So you wouldn't be able to, in the end, come out with a grant for organizational capacity and capital. It would be one or the other. So you are able to apply for multiple categories, but in the end, there will only be a singular category that um, an applicant would be eligible for funding for if they move forward in the process. And we do um, have applicants that apply multiple years. That is not unusual and is also generally encouraged. Again, noting that it, this is a very competitive process. And a lot of times it is not necessarily the quality of the application, it's just the limits of the funding in which we're not able to reach um, a lot of the, the folks that are definitely worthy of the support, um, we just have to narrow the pool down and there's always a lot more need than there is uh, funding. So please note that it is not unusual for folks to come back and apply multiple years. That is absolutely um, okay and also kind of the norm within our programs here at the Action Front. Um, there's a question. Oh, go ahead, I'll share someone who actually, I think, hit it. I was going to reply in the Q&A that said, is it correct to presume that readiness would include having a clear rationale for the project, evidence of detailed information as to the cost for the scope of work, clarity around timelines, confirmed understanding of the operational leadership needed to oversee the work, and confirmation that the finished product project would be beneficial to the community either by strengthening continued worship and or outreach efforts. So I'll say, yes, you nailed it. <laughs> that are the things that we look at when we say readiness. Um, and then also the preservation benefit of the building so that it remains in the community for people to understand the role of the black church. So that you got it. Um, there's a question about um, whether if people have like outstanding loans to folks we, we we're not gonna look at that um there's also another question about um it's my church is the church of god it's a historical black church but the church is um owned by the church of god general office um so i think in that case it's just a matter of who applies you're eligible but it's just a matter of who who needs to be the applicant Um, 
Um, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, go ahead, Alaska. Um, just to note that um, we do have folks that work with grant writers. Um, some work with grant writers, some do not, but we do not um, have any issues in terms of rules against um, this kind of engagement. I think it's just important to set the expectation that um, if you are working with a grant writer, that this is a, um, a process in which we will need to engage with this applicant over the course of the next couple months. So it's not just a hit submit and then their job is done. They would need to engage with TA, they would need to engage with staff. So setting the expectation um, in terms of the initial process and helping them understand the timeline will be critical. So you'll need to communicate that if you are working with a professional grant writer, but that is allowed. Um, so this is a question and I, this is really, this should be really a question for the church, I think, but it says, for the definition of historic, does the date of the cornerstone represent the date of the building or the date of the, con the congregation moves in? Usually it's the date that the building is constructed, but that that would that's really should be really a question for the church to answer. But um that's usually my understanding of it. But um yeah, that, cornerstones are good for that information, but the how information is put on a cornerstone sometimes varies from church to church. So you want to pay attention when looking at a cornerstone where it might say built constructed, renovated, and had a date, and that could give you an indication um, of when the building was constructed. Um, if you don't see that on the cornerstone, again, it's going to depend on how the decision was made to include information, but cornerstones are a good indication if you don't have any other written record or documents of its construction date to really look at it to see if you can get an indication of the building. Um, sometimes it might see replaced um, so that means that it was reconstructed, um, that you usually add other significant dates in the building's history on a cornerstone. But Leslie is correct. It would depend on the church's understanding of the information on this individual cornerstone. Um, there's a question that says, having received a capital grant, when will we be eligible for another, if at all? Um, so for everyone who's received any type of grant, whether it's um, from Preserving Black Churches or another grant from the trust, you would need to choose another category. So you could not apply for a capital grant. You'd need to do planning or programming or interpretation or organizational capacity or endowment. It could not be um, another capital grant. And I'll also add, we had a question about national funds for some about places. Often, but when I'll also add, we were, um, as we were talking about national, someone asked about our other church related program, National Fund for Sacred Places, for which they are participating. Um, you can apply for preserving Black churches, but you cannot match preserving Black churches grant dollars to meet any of the match requirements for National Fund for Sacred Places. There's more information in the grant guidelines and criteria on that, but um, we just want to note those stipulations in terms of various. Um, National Trust and Action Fund grant program. My apologies for the random um, audio, but I'm looking to share, please take a look at the, the questions in the chat as I'm looking to share a YouTube video um, that will help you kind of work through um, FoundNet. If you have any issues, it's kind of like an applicant tutorial. So please uh, take a look at the chat. Um, you'll see the link to this YouTube video soon. Um, and again, reach out to us at actionfundgrants at savingplaces.org if you have any technical issues that you're running into. Um, we can help you with that. Um, there's a question, and, and um, thank you for this question. There, there's a question that says, um, can you give examples of planning when thinking about um, Windows, how much planning is really needed? And I, and I think this is a good question when thinking about capital, because one of the things that can potentially happen, and again, this 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 just goes to how competitive the process is, is if you submit an ap application to us that just simply says, um, there's a problem with our windows, but you really don't know what the problem is because you haven't really gone through any sort of assessment. You, you just sort of know basically there's an issue with the windows, but you haven't had anyone look at them you haven't had anyone really tell you, well, this is the problem with the windows. This is the solution to the windows, to do, what to do with the windows. Um, that's the sort of, that's the sort of planning that goes into it. 
because often with windows, there, there are all sorts of solutions. And situations with stained glass windows, depending on where you are, sometimes that solution might be that they have to be shipped somewhere or someone has to um, come out to your site and you know work on them there, or um, they have to be scraped and painted, or they have to be, you know, there's there's all sorts of things that actually potentially um, have to be done to windows. And if you can't describe that for us, then what that tells us that is that you're not that your that your project isn't really ready to go. And we might have a whole bunch of other applications who have had someone assess their windows who then can sort of take us step by step and say, here's what's wrong with the windows. Here's the solution with the windows. Here's how much it's gonna cost. And that tells us that they're absolutely, if, if they were given the money, they're absolutely ready to go. And that's the difference between having some planning and not having some planning. And because it's, and because um, the process is so competitive that that project is most likely gonna move forward as opposed to one that just tells us hey, there's something wrong with our windows. So that's even why on something that seems relatively simple as a window project, why there needs to be some sort of planning um, involved. Um, there's a question, roof replacement. Yes, um, we, we have those requests all the time for, um, for capital projects. Leslie, did we talk about um, ADA accessibility and get us Framework around. Okay, so I've seen a couple of questions around ADA accessibility in regard to restrooms. Um, restrooms would be eligible if they are put under the framework of improving ADA accessibility. The one thing we do ask in terms of those requests, both for capital, particularly for capital, is that you do show how it is a part of a broader accessibility plan for the church. So versus just the tool that you're focusing on, such as the restrooms individually or an elevator. So what we really want to understand is how by us funding those tools to improve ADA accessibility, it helps to make the full site accessible, not only for physical needs, but other issue, other part types of accessibility, where it's visual, hearing, sensory. So um, planning to look at an accessibility plan for your entire site would be a great application to come in. But if you've already done that and now you're looking to implement those recommendations broadly, that would be an ideal capital project request. So for ADA, ADA accessibility projects, that is how we look at those requests as they come in. Okay. And I'm focusing on the questions that are coming in at the bottom of the chat, the more recent ones, and responding um, by typing answers. So if you're putting in more recent questions, I'm trying to get to as many of them as possible, but I am responding by typing the answers in. Um, this is, uh, we have a detailed estimate done by an architect and contractor on what we, on what it will take to restore our building. Would this be considered capital ready? It could be. Yes, it could it, it could potentially be. Um, the LOI application for everybody again um, can be found by ac accessing um, found in. Um, so for cemetery projects, again, that is a planning project. Um, it has to be owned by a historic um, black church. So I'm not sure because it, it says adjacent to the church, so it needs to be contiguous to the church and owned by the historic church. So I'm not clear on, it says manages, managed by two churches together. So um, you not, might need to email us on that so we can have a better understanding of that. Drywall repair and painting um, could potentially be a, a capital project. Okay, so we get this question each time, and this has to do with organ repair, which is extremely expensive. So this is really um, important for anyone who has organs, which are amazing. If your organ is actually a part of the church, it was literally built and as a, 
as a structure, as a part of the church, not one that was um, moved into the church later on. So it is literally a part of the church that could be eligible, but not one of the organs that was, you know, brought into the church later on. Um, so we wouldn't fund like a new, a new building. There's no other category that can be used for physical renovation or restoration other than capital. I just wanted to draw everyone's attention to um, the chat just to make note of the ineligible activities and or expenses. Please make sure that you review that uh, kind of list pretty thoroughly before putting together your LOI, just to make sure that any of those items um, that you may be thinking of, um, you maybe need to omit as they are ineligible um, activities and or expenses. If you, so there's a question about, um, about a situation in which they're not, in which you're not keeping um, the original church, you're building a new church, but wanting to put parts of the old church into the new church, um, that would not, that would not qualify under our program. The other thing I would note for those who, it depends on how much planning you need, but there is a percentage of capital that can go to planning. Um, so it depends on how much um, planning that you need. Um, but potentially, if you if you weren't really eligible for capital, but you really hadn't done your planning, you could be planning, you know, apply for planning one round and then apply for capital in another round. Um, there's a question about when the funds are dispersed, does it go directly to the church or the preparer? It goes to the applicant. So you want to um, make sure of who your who the applicant is. Um, this is so. So this is an important question. For the church building date, would it be the physical building the church currently occupies or where it started? It is where it's currently occupied. So where the congregation currently, so for, for the building that you are asking funds for, where the, where the church currently is and wants funds for, that is the building we are talking about. If you submit more than one project, um, you won't, and it, it's asking if, if basically if you submit more than one project, will you have endpoint input on which one is chosen? No, we will, if we decide to move one forward, that will be our choice. If your building is really close to that, 50 year mark, like it'll term 50 and 225, 2025, go ahead and go ahead and submit it. Um, you don't have to print out your LOI. Um, you can only submit it online. If you have, this, this question has to do with if there's an unforeseen issue at the church, um, we do have some emergency funds available. If you feel that you fall under that category, please email us and we can talk about that separately. Yeah, 
yes, if you're not awarded in this year, you can apply next year. Your building was built in 2008, but your ministry is 60 years old, then the, then the category that you could apply for is programming and interpretation. So your congregation started in 1868 and moved to a new location in 1963 and then added to the church in 1994. So your, so it means that your, your, Church, your church building date is 1963. This is what needs to be considered in eligibility and the LOI if our 501c3 foundation does not own the church building. Um, so you need to get with the people who actually own the church to make sure that you can, that they would need to apply. And you'd also need to make sure that the historic black church, um, that all those eligibility requirements were, were met. You can print out the LOI form to see it before it's complete, but you still need to actually complete it online. Yes, there is a grant for planning only. Um, so it says that you're a historically black congregation, but your building is not black, which so it might mean that you meet the criteria where the church was originally built for a non-white congregation, but perhaps you moved into that church. As long as you have um, been in that church for 50 years, then you still qualify. You might want to um, email us to um, get clarification on that. If your church has been operating for more than 80 years, 80 years, um, then we'll then, then we're just depending on you, you know, through so that the question is, what if a church is so old that there's no deed or records, however, it has been operating for more than 80 years, located in a very rural town of Mississippi, still active, um, then we'd be depending on, you know, whoever your church historian is, or I'm um, not so much the deed, but whoever your church historian is, or whoever, you know, whatever oral history you have um, to confirm. That's what I would say. A school that um, became a church could be eligible potentially. Our church's roof was damaged and sanctuary has suffered because of rain damage. Can we combine both situations in a capital grant? Um, you can. Um, Alicia Bradshaw, um, I would, um, I would ask you to email me or email us because this, this could be an emergency situation. This is a, this is a fire situation. So, um, so email, e email me please. So we can have a conversation. And I'll jump in. I see we have a lot, we do have a lot of questions and they're really great questions and we're really trying to answer all of them, um, but we are going to get at time. So 
do email blackchurches at savingplaces.org. I see Morgan putting that in the chat if we aren't able to get to your question. Um, hopefully a lot of them are the same questions. So if you go back and listen to the webinar when you get the link, um, you will find that information. Um, but also do visit the website for guidelines and criteria and more information for some of the more specific detailed eligibility questions. So, but we're still responding, um, but just wanted to jump in to let people know another way to get assistance if we're not able to get to your question live. Um, there's a question about a, a past application. I would tell you that we completely changed this application. So, seeing a past application, unfortunately, would not help you because um, we've completely um, revamped the application. I would suggest that everybody, you, it, the way the online system works is you can you can have it in draft and go back to it. So I would really suggest everybody just, just go ahead and log on to Foundin and just go ahead and start looking through the application. Um, it has lots of drop down boxes. It has lots of things that you know, you can just click, you know, yes or no. Um, we purposely made it to, as to not um, make it super difficult and cumbersome. Um, so I would suggest everybody just go ahead, um, who's interested in applying, just go ahead and start looking at it. That way, if you have any questions that you can then turn around and and and, and email us um, if, if, you're, if you're having any issues. Um, so I would just, ask everybody to just to just go ahead and, and start looking over that application as soon as you can. So that if you get stuck, um, you, you can ask us questions or you can, you know, go to the go to the um, website resources um, um, to look at eligibility and things like that. But um, we will be monitoring our email email boxes and we will be we will be getting back to you, you know, as as quickly as possible because we know um, you know, August 19th is coming, and so we will be answering questions as quickly as possible. Um, we, we will not um, do additions. Um, we will only work with buildings if they also meet, if they're on the same lot as a church and also meet um, the historic Black church requirements. We will not, um, we will not fund the tearing down of a church. I'm not clear on this question. It says, can I, a church apply that is currently under contract for a historical building. I'm not quite sure what you mean by that. Again, we're not doing parking lots. For the LOI stage, we don't, if you have quotes from contractors, that's great, but it is not an absolute requirement. Um, it's okay if the ownership of the, of the building has changed. Now we had a question about, um, particularly to a Catholic church, um, saying that the diocese has um, combined a number of churches under one priest and would they be eligible? Um, maybe, e again, email blackchurches at savingplaces.org so we can give you more guidance on that. But um, I would say, again, you need one applicant or entity. So I think it would go to who is has the authority to apply on behalf of those churches. Do they still operate independently? in some management structure, or is that all being managed through the diocese? So I think that would be an internal conversation to have with the diocese, but um, do email black churches at savingplaces.org and Leslie can give you more guidance on how to have those conversations. Um, there's a question about, you know, can you submit several projects or just one? 
Um, and you can, remembering that, so a couple things, when it comes to cemetery restoration, um, that can only be done, we don't really do cemetery restoration, we can only do cemetery projects under planning. Um, sanctuary needs would be done under um, capital projects and we don't do parking lots. Um, so you would really sort of need to decide um, what your priorities are. So that's for everyone when thinking about all of your needs. Um, remember that for capital projects, um, we've increased the amount that you can apply for. Um, so think about um, a really cohesive um, scope of work for capital, but also think about what your priority is. Is your priority planning or is your priority capital? Um, and that's how you should think about um, what you should submit. Um, so this, this, is, this is a great question. Our building is over 50 years old and built by a white congregation. It has been a um, black congregation for decades. How do we prove it was black for 50 years? Um, you're, we're we, we have faith in you. <laughs> you're you're gonna you're gonna tell us uh, that it was 50 years and we're gonna believe you. That's what's gonna happen. And and that goes for everyone. We we're not gonna come to your church and ask you to turn over your records. Um you're gonna, you know, we're we're gonna have faith in everybody. That's what that's what's gonna happen. So we had a couple of questions since you talked about the emergency and rapid response. So just want to let people know, Preserving Black Churches does have an emergency and rapid response grant, um, but that process starts with an email to blackchurches at savingplaces.org um, so that we can assess the situation because there are particular guidelines and criteria of when those funds would be applicable. So I would say if you do think you have an emergency request outside of this grant cycle to just email an inquiry to blackchurches at savingplaces.org and Leslie will reach out to you to discuss the situation and give you a recommendation on guidelines, criteria and eligibility. Yes, please do. Um, and that, and that, that doesn't stop you from submitting an LOI. I'm not saying don't, um, submit for an LOI, um, but it does mean that we should also have an additional um, conversation um, about some other avenues as well. Um, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of questions, uh, again, about um, our categories, and I just really want everybody to go, I just really want to reiterate, please everybody go to our website and look at um, what we have under each cap category. Um, and remembering that capital projects is generally what you're physically doing to your building. Um, planning is what you do before the building. Programming interpretation is telling your story. Organizational capacity is actually hiring somebody to who's gonna you know, oversee your, your preservation program or your preservation projects. And endowment on um, financial sustainability is again that, that the only grant where you match that's gonna allow you to pull down money, a percentage to actually help you take care of preservation projects over time. But in terms of, again, Alaska mentioned it earlier, earlier in terms of looking at what's ineligible, make sure you look at that list, but also make sure you actually um, go to each category where it outlines sort of different examples of those, of what's in each category. Um, and if you still have questions, please follow up with us. I also think it's important that when we talk about the endowment, that that is an investment account that has to be created or already exists, that our grant would be to add to the principal of that account and matched with one-to-one -one match of what you would contribute. And it has to be invested for at least three years and set up to um, provide at least a 5% draw of interest to support the preservation and maintenance of the church. So please review those guidelines and criteria for the endowment and financial sustainability category because it gives specific um, information on what has to be created or already existing to be eligible to receive those funds in that category. 
there's a question about whether a planning project can include some investigation um, that may that might require removal of a portion of a slab. Absolutely, part of what a planning project is in some cases is absolute investigation to figure out what the issue is and and how you need to um, move forward. Um, we would not um, uh, grant for the purchase of a vehicle. Alaska, what what kind of proof have we have we do we look at for ownership, or do we just have somebody sign as yes, the owner? Yeah, we just exactly. We just have a have the applicant excuse me, the applicant upload um, and a document indicating um, that if they are not, if the applicant is not the owner, that the owner has given permission for this uh, site to be at the center of this application. So it would essentially be a letter of consent. Okay, we have about 10 minutes left. There's a question that this keeps on coming up. There's someone that's saying, I've seen this several times. I'm having finding difficulty to find a letter of intent form tips. I'm not sure. The the form tips is part of our presentation. Um, so again, that will be emailed to, to everyone um, after this. Yes. Um, so there is a question about essentially a church has had um, additions or or changes that are newer than the building. You know, is that OK? It, it still meets that criteria. And the answer is yes. There's a question about whether um, uh, is it too late to request feedback? Um, and it would be very difficult if we're in, since we're already in the process to do back um, from last year's application at this point. But we're happy to answer questions about um, the LOI at this point. Um, yes, um, drawings are required for um, HAV, HVAC um, um, submittals, but not for the LOI at this point. Yes, administration costs can be, um, there is a percentage um, for capital that can be um, put into the grant for administration costs. Um, if if you if if there's so there's a question about if people need help with the the letter of intent. Um, again, I would I would first um, really encourage everybody to go ahead and 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 sign on Foundin and start looking over the letter of intent. If you run into issues at that point, um, then um, reach out to us. Yes. So the question is, if um, 
if you are have a multi-phased project, so if you're like in phase one that you're currently working on, the question is, can you ask for funding for another phase? And yes, you are eligible to do that. Again, um, we will not reimburse for work that is done before um, the award, which wouldn't happen till next year. Leslie, I think we should share for timeline purposes. Um, again, the LOI is due August 19th. Those that are invited to submit a full application, it will be due in October on October. Fourth, correct. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, someone also noted. Um, we apologize. We'll correct this on the website. It says um, Monday, October fourth, but October fourth is actually a Friday. So we will correct yeah. that, and we apologize for that. Um, the those who are awarded a grant this app this grant cycle is for our twenty twenty five grantees. Mm -hmm. The announcement will be in February of twenty twenty five. So if you're thinking of your project timeline, as Leslie stated, any work completed prior to the awarding or funds or signing of a grant agreement is not eligible. So when you get to that question, the application about your project start date, project end date, really think I would put that in as no sooner than spring of next year if you were awarded funding. So just wanna give you all this guidance that this is for our 2025 grantees which will the announcement will occur um, February of 2025. Um, I'll ask a really quick, um, someone says the LOI mentioned something about an access code. How do we get that? So um, this is something that you'll see at the top right of your screen, but that's not required for the Preserving Black Churches application. Um, once you hit the apply link um, on your dashboard that you'll see when you log in, you'll want to look at the full list of opportunities that you, ha that you have available to you here at the trust, and you would select the Preserving Black Churches application. So the access code, while it is presented there, that is for unique situations, um, very specific opportunities when we're reaching out for um, app information for specific applicants, but for preserving Black churches, there is no access code needed. So with that, um, I think um, I, I know that we haven't been able to um, get to all of y'all's questions, but I hope that this presentation um, has been helpful. Um, I wanna encourage um, everyone that if you have, you know, if your question hasn't been answered, um, to email us. Um, if you think that you have an emergency situation, there were a few people that I called out specifically, um, please follow up with me. Um, if you, I would like um, for all of you who are interested in applying for the LOI, I would like for you to just go ahead um, and get on Foundin and start your application. Um, there was, um, someone mentioned in the comments about the 50 questions that that's referring to the full application. Um, the LOI does not have 50 questions. Um, it has far fewer than that. Um, so I, I'd like um, for all of y'all to just um, go ahead and, and, and start working on it. And then if you get stuck or if you have questions, um, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, I know August um, 19th is coming soon, but we are here um, to help you um, as much as we can. Um, and um, to anyone, either um, Alaska or Tiffany, do you have any final words here? I will just add that um, please reach out to us if you have any issues, um, especially those who are log trying to log in and you're noticing that you are already in the system in some capacity. That's a very common issue and we can fix it pretty rather rather quickly. Um, please take your time with these LOIs and give us as much context for what's happening at your at your church as possible. Um, we're looking to understand, again, your level of readiness as we are evaluating these applications um, and be in touch with us if you have any issue. Thank you for joining us tonight.
Yes, thank you all. We're so appreciative of your support for preserving Black churches. We're really excited for this to be the third year of this program and offering this grant. And we're really excited that we'll be able to award a higher amount for capital grants in our funding category. So we look forward to receiving your LOIs. We have a great team with our grant staff and our preservation team that are available to assist you as much as possible, but we do ask for your patience. As we know, there'll be a lot of requests for support, but we will try to be as responsive as possible. So please visit the website, please review the criteria thoroughly, um, and make sure that you are familiar with it. And we, again, look forward to having another great group of applicants in February, excuse me, grantees in February of 2025. So thank you.